this is a book I just got from thriftbooks.com. Uh, children's Folklore. And here's a picture they have. What do a tale, a joke, a fiddle tune, a quilt, a jig, a game of jacks, a saint's day procession, a snake fence, and a Halloween costume have in common? Not much, at first glance, but all these forms of human creativity are part of a zone of our cultural and uh, life and experience that we sometimes call folklore. The word for folklore means the cultural traditions that are learned and passed along by ordinary people as part of the fabric of their lives and culture. Folklore may be passed along in verbal form, like the urban legend that we hear about from friends who assure us that it really happened to a friend or their cousin. Or it may be tunes or dance steps we pick up on the block, or ways of shaping things to use or admire out of materials readily available to us. Like that quilt our aunt made, often we acquire folklore without even fully realizing where or how we learned it. Though we might imagine that the word folklore refers to cultural traditions from far away or long ago, we actually, we actually use and enjoy folklore as part of our own daily lives. It is often ordinary, yet we often remember and prize it because it seems somehow very special. Folklore is culture we share with others in our communities. We build our identities through the sharing. Our first shared identity is family identity. The family folklore, such as shared meals or prayers or songs, helps us develop a sense of belonging. But as we grow older, we learn to belong to other groups as well. Our identities may be ethnic, religious, occupational, or re regional, or all of these, since no one has only one cultural identity. But in every case, the identity is anchored and strengthened by a variety of cultural traditions in which we participate. I'm outside. Share with our neighbors. We feel the threads of connection with people we know, but the threads extend far beyond our own immediate communities. In a real sense, they connect us in one way or another to the world. Folklore possesses features by which we dis distinguish ourselves from each other. A certain dance step may be African-American, or a certain story urban, or a certain hymn Protestant, or a certain food preparation Cajun. Folklore can distinguish us, but at the same time, it is one of the best ways we introduce ourselves to each other. We learn about new ethnic groups on the north. American landscape by sampling every cuisine and we enthusiastically adopt musical ideas from our communities. Stories, songs, and visual designs move from group to group 
enriching all people in the process. Folklore, thus, is both a sign of identity experienced as a special marker of our special groups, and at the same time a cultural coin that is well spent by sharing with others beyond our group boundaries. Folklore is usually learned informally. Somebody somewhere taught us that jump rope rhyme we know, but we may have trouble remembering just where we got it, and it probably wasn't in a book that was assigned as homework. Our world has a domain of formal knowledge, but folklore is a domain of knowledge and cultural that is learned by sharing and, Im and Im imitation rather than formal instruction. We can study it formally. That's what we are doing now. But its natural arena is in the informal, person-to-person -person fabric of our lives. Not all cultural is folklore. Classical music, art sculpture, or great novels are forms of high art that may contain folklore, but are not themselves folklore. Popular music or art may be built on fo folklore themes and traditions, but it addresses a much wider and more diverse audience than folk music or folk art. But even in the world of popular and mass culture, folklore keeps popping up around the margins. Email is not folklore, but email smile is. The college football is not folklore. But the wave we do at the stadium is. This series of volumes explores the many faces of folklore throughout the North American con continent by illuminating the many aspects of folklore in our lives. We hope to help readers of the series of this series to appreciate more fully the richness of the cultural fabric they either possess already or can easily encounter as they interact with their North American neighbors. And I'm going to start reading about these folklores, the children's folklores. One, chapter one, why children like traditions, a sense of security. Things have changed so much since I, since I was young. Adults share this sentiment often, especially when feeling frustrated with something they experience as different from what it was in their childhood. They're not things, they're right, things do change. But changes they are talking about are in the outside world, things like cloning animals. Rising divorce rates and suicide bombings were not part of their generation's headlines. The truth is, however, that inwardly we don't change so readily. The things we count on, like love, forgiveness, belonging, and trust, stay the same. From generation to generation, we need to be in relationships where we feel safe and valuable. How do we shape these feelings within families? One important way is by continuing traditions, things that we practice over and over again. Family traditions are begun whenever relatives gather together to talk, to celebrate, to work, or to play. One way families share special times together is by telling stories. Some may not, maybe, I mean, 
Some may be about that great camping trip with Uncle Will when he hooked a bird's nest for his lunch. Oh, how about when great-grandma and great-grandpa moved to the United States, carrying one set of clothes in grandma's favorite stew pot? Then there's the story of how dad spent one whole month building a doghouse for Max, who never went inside it. These stories may, these stories bring a family together and share a intergenerational love that makes children feel connected to the past and future. You may remember hearing Mom and Aunt Mary reminisce about Graham telling them, Life's not fair when they endured some disappointing times. And just last week, Graham shared... Same wisdom when some when you couldn't understand why Jim got picked for the soccer team instead of you. In a situation like that, doesn't it help to know you suffered the same frustrations, but also the same support as your mom? Sayings and anecdotes like these are a part of children's folklore, and so are stories. Every child loves stories. Once there was a little girl named Tutu Moon. She and her mama lived in a one-room house in a forest. They were very poor, but they were also very happy, except for one thing. A terrible giant came to their little home every day looking for food. Every morning when Tutu Moon woke up, she fastened her hair in a knot with her long hairpin and hurried to the woods to help Mama gather firewood and herbs to sell in their village market. When they finished their work, Mama made plain rice for breakfast. She and Tutu Moo ate the rice every morning, but Mama also had a huge pot of sweet porridge with tasty rice flour, coconut milk, and lots of sugar. Tutu Moo and her mama never tasted the delicious porridge. Never tasted, never tasted, yeah. Though, because if the giant came and didn't find a full moon of porridge, he would eat Tutu Moo instead. After breakfast, Mama left for the market. Tutu Moo stayed home and did the housework. She shook out their sleeping mat, swept the floor, and washed their few dishes. Then she went outside to play. When she heard the f giant's footsteps, boom, 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 on the doorstep, and shut and locked the door, she was very scared as she waited. The giant came up to the house and yelled, Tutu Moo, where are you? And Tutu Moo answered, In the house. And where is your mama? At the market. And where is your porridge? In the pot. Then he ate the whole pot of porridge in one big gulp and went back into the forest. This happened every day, even when mama Um, sorry, I lost my place. Even when Mama returned from food, with the food she bought, with the day's earning, there was never enough food for her and Tutu Moo. Mama began selling less at the market. Finally, could only feed at the market, and finally could only feed the giant. Tutu Moo and her Mama was starving. One morning, when Tutu Moo woke up, she fastened her hair in a knot with her long hairpin and hurried to the woods to help Mama gather firewood and herbs to sell at the village market. Since Mama only had enough food to make the porridge for the giant, she and Tutu Moo did not eat. 
When Mama finished making the porridge, she left for the market. Poor Tutu Moo. The smell of the porridge was too much for her. She began to take only a spoonful, then another, and another, until a quarter of the porridge was gone. When she heard the giant's footsteps, boom, 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 she covered the pot, put it on the doorstep, and shut and locked the door. She was very scared as she waited. The giant came up to the house and yelled, Tutu Moo, where are you? And Tutu Moo answered, In the house! And where is your mama? At the market. And where is my porridge? In the pot. The giant took off the cover of the pot and looked in. This is not full, he yelled. Tutu Moo, where are you? Tutu Moo did not answer. The giant knocked down the door, reached into the house, and found Tutu Moo. With one gulp, he swallowed her. Please let me out, she shouted from the giant's stomach, but he just stamped back into the woods. Tutu Moo was very scared until she remembered her long hairpin. She took it from her hair and stuck the giant. The giant yelped. She stuck him again. Again he cried out, telling her to stop, but Tutu Moo stuck him again and again. Desperate to, to escape the pain in his belly, he ran about so wildly that he tripped on a root, hit his head on a rock, and the giant was dead. When Mama returned from the market, she had sold everything that day and bought rice and fish and vegetables and even roasted peanuts as a special treat for Tutu Moo. When she saw the porridge pot, the porridge thrown on the ground, and her mouth turned into a fright, oh, she could not find Tutu Moo. She called, Tutu Moo, where are you? But no one answered. Mama ran to the forest, following the giant's footstep, till still calling, Tutu Moo, where are you? When she found the dead giant, Tutu Moo answered her yells. I'm in the giant. Mama opened the giant's mouth wide and came in. Tutu Moo. From that time, Tutu Moo and her mom, Mama were very happy. They had no giant to feed, so they had enough food them for themselves. And they ate sweet porridge for breakfast every single day. You may not like sweet porridge, but do you have a favorite food that your mother makes on one of your special days? Food traditions are a large part of family customs. Christmas cookies, Easter cake, and blueberry pancakes on Dad's birthday all things you will never forget. They will shape the tradition you pass on to your own children. Tradition doesn't only happen help children as to feel safe and happy. It also an important part of providing children with a moral education. As adults try to impart moral standards, they learn quickly that preaching only turns children away from the salt after results. But through their stories, celebrations, prayers, jokes, and songs, parents and grandparents pass along their moral values. Folklore is steep in ethical concepts. When they hear the tale about Rapunzel and her, and her prince, Children love the story, even though the prince was beside himself with grief, and in his despair he jumped right down from the tower. And though he escaped with his life, the thorns are among which he fell pierced his eyes open. Then he wandered blind and miserable through the woods, eating nothing but roots and berries and weeping and lamenting the loss of his lovely bride. At the end, his sight is restored by the tears of his true love, Rapunzel. Children count on good overcoming evil. The 
ancient fairy tale traditions continue to survive because they continue to treasure to reassure children. These stories, particularly in their original forms, are not innocent tales for the weak and young. They acknowledge that evil exists and terrible things happen, but in the end, order and goodness is affirmed. When children hearing these stories, they so absorb a world view that is ultimately optimistic, creative, and self-confident. Children's folklore is passed along not through formal education, but during times of play and family traditions. All the customs, games, and traditions of ch childhood add to the child's sense of security. Families provide traditions through the past that influence children today. And that's all for right now.